Good morning and welcome to, to this, the fourth uh, meeting of 2014 of the European External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off and can I once again welcome Dan Keneally, who is Dr Dan Keneally, who is our advisor to the Committee on Work Inquiry to aspects of the Scottish Government's white paper relating to the European Union. Uh, don't have any apologies. Uh, welcome everyone for attendance. Agenda item one is the Scottish Government's proposal for an independent Scotland membership of the European Union and it's the item today is um, to welcome our very first panel. Um, we have two panels of witnesses today. Our first panel today is Professor Michael Keating, Professor of Politics at the University of Aberdeen and Director of the ESRC, Scottish Centre on Constitutional Change, Economic and Social Research Council, Programme on the Future of the UK and Scotland. Welcome. We have Associate Professor Anders Vivo, the, from the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. Welcome. And on a video link with us today, we have Professor Baldur Torhalsen, who is a Professor of Political Science and Jean Monet, Chair in European Studies in the University of Iceland. Welcome to you, Baldur. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. I believe um, because we have started on a slightly different topic um, for this inquiry, looking at small states and the influence of small states, that uh, you all have a uh, um, a very brief opening statement to make. So, um, I, 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 Anders, if you want to go first, yeah? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I'll start out just by saying a, a few words on, on how small states can maximize influence in the, in the European Union. Uh, if we look at the traditional small state strategies in international affairs, uh, I think there are three strategies that kind of uh, have been very significant. The first one is hiding. Uh, that is basically staying out of trouble by staying out of sight, uh, by neutrality or non-alignment usually. Then there's binding, uh, that is preventing trouble from occurring by creating and strengthening the governance of international affairs, of international rules and institutions. Uh, of course, uh, international organizations, institutions are prominent here, including the European Union. And then the final uh, of, of those prominent strategies have been seeking shelter, protection against financial turmoil, uh, security threats, uh, that is in uh, NATO or uh, the EU, for example. And these strategies are not obsolete, uh, but they have lost importance as a consequence of globalization, institutionalization, and, and Europeanization, creating, a, you could say, a, an international affairs with a complex network of, of overlapping institutions and new actors uh, seeking uh, influence. So hiding today is virtually impossible. Uh, binding is often ineffective uh, by itself uh, because the powers you wish to bind, they'll take their negotiations elsewhere, and seeking shelter is not really uh, enough. It's basically a defensive strategy, and if what you want is to, uh, to maximize your, your influence, that is not enough. Instead, uh, if you look at the experience of small states in uh, the European Union, uh, they have sought uh, influence uh, by using uh, a more offensive strategy. We sometimes call this a smart state strategy, uh, and this has three fundamental aspects. Uh, the first aspect concerns the political substance of the strategy. Uh, the political substance of the strategy must present or be part of the solution to a problem recognized by all or most of the relevant political actors. Uh, small states do not have sufficient resources. They do not have uh, political clout to pursue a political agenda, which is radically different from the major actors, uh, let alone in opposition uh, to them. So small states need to tap in to the dominant uh, discourses uh, in uh, the institutional networks that, where they wish to uh, get uh, influence. They cannot present something which is, is, is wholly an alternative. The second aspect concerns the form of the strategy. Uh, here it's important that the small states, uh, they focus their resources. They need to have a fairly narrow uh, agenda uh, because uh, they do not have the resources to pursue broad uh, political uh, agendas. And they need to be uh, very much aware on where they add value to the uh, political process, where do they have something to add, uh, and where uh, will they therefore be able uh, to uh, speak uh, with uh, confidence and get influence. And the third aspect concerns the role of the small state uh, itself. Uh, I think in, in also in, in, in the papers uh, presented in preparation to, to, uh, to this uh, committee, there's one uh, kind of expression uh, that is uh, often uh, written that it is the honest broker uh, in order to maximize its own influence the small state must aim to position itself as such an honest broker acting independently of any of the 
big member states' interests, uh, working within the dominant discourse of the Union, but at the same time avoiding being identified too closely with any particular uh, interest, uh, actor's interests. And if this is to be done uh, successfully, uh, the small state needs to allocate sufficient resources uh, at home and also in, in Brussels to do this, and also initiatives need to be focused on the long term and, and well prepared, so you cannot shift your focus or your agenda uh, all uh, of the time. I think I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you, and thank you very much for your written evidence as well. It's very helpful um, to reference them. Uh, Professor Michael Keating. Yes, the comments in our paper are very consistent with what Anders has just said, that small states don't have the same economic or political weight as large states. And when it comes to intergovernmental bargaining, large states have the advantage of economic power and more votes in the Council of Ministers. Small states very rarely use the veto or threaten to use the veto because there are huge costs to doing that. So when it comes to big intergovernmental issues, very often it's the big states who sort things out, sometimes outside the formal institutions and just present a fait accompli. But when it comes to the community method, that's the traditional way of doing policy in which the commission takes the initiative, not the member states, and things are worked through a very complex process of committees and consultation, member states, the committee of permanent representatives of the parliament and so on. In those areas, very often the people who get their way are the people who are best prepared and who have the best ideas. And small states do best in this kind of negotiation if they have an idea which is not just in their own interest but in the broader general interest. This was supposed to be how the European Union worked when it was set up. It's not always worked like that. It's become a bit more intergovernmental. So appeal to the general interest and have a good idea. Be well prepared. It's also important to get in early when it's the question of the community method because it's the Commission that formulates the proposals and if you're in there at the beginning you can shape the proposals at a very early stage rather than waiting to a late stage when something comes to the Council of Ministers, when it tends to be the big states that take over. It's also extremely important to be well organised. Big states have more resources to put into European policy making. Small states have to be more flexible, they have to be much more focused. And the evidence is that some small states are much better at this than others. And it's because they're well organised, they know what's going on in Europe, <coughs> Their delegations in Europe, whether it's in the Committee of Permanent Representatives or the Council of Ministers, are in touch with the relevant people back home, and they can take decisions very quickly. There's also a learning process that states who've been in the EU for longer tend to be better, tend to be more influential. They know their way around. They very often held the presidency of the Council of Ministers, which gives them an awful lot of contacts. They've got networks in place, and networks are extremely important in Europe. <clears throat> having the right people, knowing where to go to, having people from your country working in the European institutions, which is something that the UK has been extremely bad at in recent years, but Ireland, for example, has been very good at, and therefore learning how European uh, policymaking actually works. And finally, it's important to specialise, to focus on the key issues and not try to cover everything, because small states simply don't have the resources to cover everything. Thank you very much, and thank you for your written evidence as well, um, uh, Professor Keating. Um, uh, Professor Torhalson, um, are you willing to give an opening statement to our committee? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for your welcome, uh, Madam Convener and members of the committee. Uh, I'm very pleased to share my views with you today. Let me briefly explain my background. I, I studied in Britain at the University of Essex. In the last 20 years, I have taught and written about small states, um, about my favorite subject, small states, at several universities in Europe and the USA. And I founded the Center for Small State Studies several years ago here in, in Iceland, which is a research center. In my country, I'm active in domestic and foreign policy. And I was an alternate member of our national parliament for the Social Democratic Alliance in the last parliamentary term. I'm a supporter of Iceland's membership of the EU 
And personally, I regret uh, that our uh, accession process has been suspended. As far as Scotland is concerned, my personal position is neutral on the question of your independence. That's for the Scottish people for decide. But I do believe strongly that it would be in the interests of an independent Scotland to remain within the European Union. I hope these remarks will help you to understand where I'm coming from. On small states, concerning their role within the EU, I think there are three important questions that one needs to consider. Can they overcome the disadvantages of their small size? Can they defend their interests? Can they become influential and proactive in the decision-making processes of the Union? Small states face economic and political problems associated with their greater vulnerability and more limited capacity. In my view, it is important uh, for them to acknowledge these limitations. They need to accept the fact that they don't have as much capacity as large states and have to compensate for their weaknesses. So in few words, can small states defend their interests and become active participants in the EU's decision making? First, they have to prioritize, as has already been mentioned. I would say that prioritization is the key word for small states to become active participants in the EU. They need to accept the fact that they cannot take an active part in all of the EU's activities. They have to focus on their main economic and political interests and leave others on the side. Second, small states need to make the utmost of their diplomatic skills and their limited size. They need to exploit the characteristics which are often associated with small administration. And here we are talking about flexibility in decision making, informality and greater room of maneuver. Flexibility is the key word for a small administration to cope with the burden of membership. Skillful negotiation tactics are crucial and small states need excellent negotiators. Third, small states must have the skills to take initiatives in the day-to-day decision-making in the Union in order to become active members. This requires good knowledge in all the policy sectors that are of importance uh, to them. To summarize these points, a small state can defend its interests and become active within the EU if it builds on the features that I have mentioned, prioritization, diplomatic skills, initiatives, and knowledge. And now I want to mention four points which can help small states to become influential. First, networking and coalition building in crucial. It is basically all about alliance formation. It is of fundamental importance. Second, in order to become influential, small states have to be able to show leadership skills. The requirement is a well-grounded knowledge in a particular field and to gain the trust of other members and the EU institutions. In order to be trusted with the leadership duties, a state needs to be able to present its ideas in a skillful and clear manner and present solutions to problems. Then there are features which we might call structural factors. For instance, the Nordic states are are seen as norm setters in fields of environmental protection, women's rights, and development assistance. This has been of considerable value for them within the EU. They use this image to get issues on the agenda, build coalitions, and get their issues through the EU. Some academics talk about the Nordic states as norm entrepreneurs, 
in these fields. Finally, how to do more with less? Small states have less interests in many areas than large states and are therefore better able to secure deals in areas that are of importance for them. They can be flexible on in unimportant issues if they get what they want in their fields of interests. This is a value in the big package deals that the EU makes from time to time. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, very comprehensive opening statements from you all and lots of avenues that we could go down. One of the, the things that, that all of you have referred to is the, the difference between small and large states and how they you know, are considered to influence. Is the term small and large states actually helpful? Because I think in one aspect it's based on population, but maybe in another aspect it's based on economic growth or economic impact. Insight into that, yeah. I'll, I'll say a few words on that. I, I think, well, I think it's it's uh, it's 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 useful uh, because if you look at the uh, at the uh, at the European Parliament, or if you how many votes you've got in the in in, in, in when when you when uh, in, in the council, then you can see that, that there are differences between, of course, between uh, smaller states and larger states. There's not a clear-cut definition, and it doesn't make sense to make a clear-cut definition. But you might say that uh, those states who are not able kind of to, to shake the European Union, uh, they need to act within it uh, in another way than those who are able to shake it. You can say that, that if, if Britain or if uh, France or if uh, Germany has a certain agenda, that will have an impact uh, on, on all of Europe. Uh, if, uh, if, if Denmark has a certain uh, agenda, and in, in particular if Denmark has, for instance, a, a negative agenda or threatens to do something in, in, in Europe, uh, nobody really cares but, 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 but Denmark most of the time and within most policy issues. So in that sense, there are structural differences on, on what small states and, 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 and the bigger member states can, uh, can, can do, and, and, uh, and there are differences in what they do uh, if you look at, at, uh, at uh, the use of veto or, or, or threatening to, to, to use uh, veto, uh, then the small states very, very rarely uh, will do that uh, also because they, are, they know they are in this uh, position. So in that sense, uh, it, it makes sense. It also makes sense in, in terms of uh, resources. How many resources do you have on the ground in Brussels and how many resources can you allocate uh, at home? I think small states can do something to, uh, to, to make up for this by, as we've all three of us have, have spoken about, by, uh, by prioritizing, uh, by focusing on, uh, on, on, uh, on selected issues. They can say, we wish, uh, we want to make an impact on, on climate or on fishery policies or uh, in another selected area, and we can put some resources into that uh, in, 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 in our capital and in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in what we do in Brussels and in expertise. And small states can do something else as well, uh, by uh, providing, uh, and I think that's sometimes a bit understated and, 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 and there's not so much focus on that, but also on, on, on providing uh, training and career paths for, uh, for both civil servants and, uh, and, and also for politicians uh, who wish to, 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 to influence in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. I think there's a, for, for all member states, there's a real uh, 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 challenge in uh, in that the civil servants and and also the the uh, the, the politicians who sit in, in the European Parliament or who just sit on who have just focused on on, on Europe in the national parliaments that they kind of get for, they are forgotten uh, by the public or they're forgotten uh, by uh, by the system. We have a, a, a saying in, in in Danish. I don't know if you if if you have it as well that that when you're 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 out of sight, you're out of mind, uh, and that is what sometimes happens of the civil servants who pursue a career in, in, in Europe feels what, what, uh, what happens. So in that sense, small states can do something uh, to, uh, to get influence, but what they cannot do and what they must accept as their starting point is that there are some structural disadvantages. Okay, thanks very much. Professor Keating, um, in your evidence and, and the written and the both verbal evidence on this issue about small and large states and the influence that they have and picking up on what uh, Anders Vivel has just said, uh, given Scotland's climate change legislation, you know, its fishing policies, its life sciences centres and its energy policy, particularly renewable, renewable energy, do you see those having an impact on you know, whether you're described as a small state or a large state in that context? Yeah, well, the 
term large state and small state, these are very imprecise terms. They're not legal terms. It's just a very general way of, of framing things. And if we could start at the other end, we, in the past, people used to talk about the European community, as it then was, being based upon this Franco-German axis, they used to set the agenda, and other people have said, well, it's a directorate of the big states, the British are in there, and maybe the Italians and the Spanish. Those are the uh, other large states with a large amount uh, of influence who sometimes cut deals amongst each other. Everybody else, more or less, is a small state. Uh, and the recent accessions have brought in more small states. So small states are clearly in the majority. That's the normal thing to be. Uh, and that's just a, a rough working definition. What do you do if you're outside that directorate? Now, uh, I was actually thinking and noting down some of those things upon which Scotland might have a particular interest, and they're precisely those ones. And there's obviously a competition policy, which is a, a critically important thing, sometimes neglected. Uh, there's agriculture, which is economically a minor sector, but spends an awful lot of the community budget still. And then, indeed, there's energy, whether it is hydrocarbons or renewable energy, where Scotland has a particular interest and made it a particular uh, investment. Uh, and then there's, there's higher education. Now, I'm not saying that because I come from university, but Scotland has a, a highly performing university sector and a highly performing research sector. In the public sector, it's private research output is rather, is rather poor, rather unimpressive. But uh, in, in the public sector, it, it performs extremely well. And that's something that Europe is interested in and something that Scotland could contribute to. And there's another question, too, which is this whole business of dealing with nationality questions. Where in Scotland, we've actually done this rather well because we do it democratically and peacefully and whatever the referendum outcome, people will accept it. That's, that's, that's not usual. Uh, now, that is something that the European Union is concerned with, the Council of Europe, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and so on. That's something that we could uh, export. That's, these are modes of dealing with things that other people might be interested in. So there's four or five issues on which Scotland might have something to teach as well as something to learn from the rest of Europe. Thanks very much. Um, Professor Tohalson, um, given that you know, Iceland is a very small, small state um, and, and not part of Europe, but, Europe, but obviously in, in the context of your beliefs, um, you would hope to be part of Europe. Do, do you see where small states um, could make that impact and how that relates to you know, the power of the large states? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> From my point of view, I think it's very important to, to distinguish between small and large states within the Union. The reason for this is the fact, as I see it, is that small states need, need to use different methods in order to have a say within the Union. Uh, first of all, they have to identify their main interests, economic and political interests, and then it comes all down to administrative competence administrative competence, and then use these special characteristics of small uh, public administration, which I just which I mentioned in my statement, like flexibility, informality, and greater uh, maneuver. If we, I don't think we get the right picture of small states or, or of the role of small states in the union if we would just count the number of votes in the Council of Ministers or the numbers of MEPs, then we get in a way a wrong picture of the power potential of small states in the EU. We need to look how they, how they use informal methods and uh, in order to have, have, have a say. That's, that's of, of fundamental uh, importance. Concerning uh, Iceland, Iceland, of course, uh, not a member of the EU, but is part of the European Economic Air Area, we adopt most of the EU legislation uh, because we are part of the common market, except for the fields of agriculture and fisheries. Iceland in a position within the EEA not to be able to have any say of the leg legislation. It, we, we just have to uh, uh, accept uh, the laws or the rules coming from Brussels due to the institutional structure of the EEA agreement. And from my personal point of view, this is not uh, acceptable for an independent and a sovereign state. But people may, of course, dis disagree on this. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go to op opening questions. If colleagues uh, would like to catch my eye, if they've got questions to ask, and I've got Hansala Malik up first. Uh, thank you. Good morning and welcome to sunny Edinburgh. 
Um, I, I just want to tease out this uh, small and large membership. I mean, um, it is my opinion that large membership means you have more MEPs at Parliament, uh, and surely that is a significant factor in anything that you decide. Therefore, the smaller nations will probably have to either tag on with one of the larger uh, European nations or come up with some sort of coalition with other smaller partners to, if they have mutual interests. It's all driven by mutual interest, surely. But I think the important issue here in terms of identifying small and large, I, I would have thought it was quite clear cut. Uh, I'm a little surprised to hear that there's a gray area, and if there is one, if someone can explain which is the gray area, what is the gray area? Well, we were in Sweden a, a couple of months ago, and we started saying that uh, small states like Sweden, they said, no, we're a big state because we're bigger than Denmark and Norway, so it's relative. Uh, Poland is maybe a big state, maybe the Netherlands. There's a continuum. There's not a clear distinction. But we were interested in where Scotland would be at 5 million. That is clearly at the small state end. There's no doubt about where, where Scotland would be. Uh, yes, it's true that larger states have more MEPs, but smaller states have more MEPs per capita. So they're disproportionately represented. But the main point is that MEPs do not vote by country. They vote by party group. So, uh, yes, of course, to some extent, they represent constituency interests, but when the votes come, there's a high degree of party discipline. The Social Democrats vote one way, the Christian Democrats another way, the Liberals another way, and so on. Okay, so, um, so the suggestion, what is the suggestion? Are you saying that despite the fact one country may have five members more than another, uh, they're equal? Or are you saying that no, if you no, I'm, saying, I'm saying that the German MEPs who are numerous yeah. don't vote as German as a bloc. The Social Democrats vote way, one way. The Christian Democrats may vote another way. In fact, there aren't many votes where the parties disagree. The thing works by consensus. Uh, so that, that's, that's a complication. Uh, but your, your main point is right, that the big countries have a bigger presence in, in all the institutions. Uh, in the Council of Ministers, they have more votes, which can be critical there are more M M MEPs, they have a bigger, a bigger weight. That's, that's our starting point, I think, the point we've all made. So small states have got to act differently. They can't throw their weight around because they don't have any weight to throw around. It's fair to say that smaller states would need to be more cooperative and, and work in, in partnership with, yeah. with people rather than try to that's, that's, influence. That's, that's it, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, that's do you want to on that point? Yeah. yeah yes. Just, just, just two, uh, two, 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 two brief uh, uh, points on, 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 on your important question. I think there are, uh, in, just in, in, in addition to Professor Keating, I, I think there are two additional ways that it, that it, that it matters. On, on uh, if you look at the, uh, the uh, uh, members of the European Parliament, and I think uh, one way. Uh, that they matter is that they provide links back to the national political system. Uh, at least uh, that's the evidence in in, uh, in in a number of small states, uh, in, in, in including uh, Denmark. That they 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 that's kind of a, a, an information link there. They 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 tell uh, the, uh, the, the the politicians and in the national political system what what is kind of on the agenda in, in Brussels. What are what are people talking about in in uh, in the in the hallways? What are the kind of upcoming uh, issues? And I think there's a, a, another way that MEPs matter, and, and that's a, a way that they matter uh, in quality and, and and not so much in in uh, in, in, in quantity. I think it's 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 true that uh, when they vote, they vote by 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 party, and uh, and and there's a strong party discipline. But as they prepare the the uh, the, uh, the 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 issues uh, and and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 rules, of course, that's kind of negotiations going on, and uh, there are uh, MEPs playing an important role in in, in committees, and uh, some of them take the role of, of rapporteurs. That is, you know, being responsible for writing uh, and and summing up on on the issues and writing reports on the particular issues and and what is to be done. And even though there's a, there's a party discipline, it it does it 
it does matter uh, where you come from. It does matter if you have a certain approach to, to this uh, uh, particular issue, a, 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 a parliamentarian from, 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 from Denmark or, or, or Sweden will, will have a different approach to, uh, to, to climate policy uh, than one coming uh, perhaps from, uh, from, from, uh, from uh, one of the Central or Eastern uh, uh, European uh, member states. So in that sense, uh, I, I, I think it does matter. If Professor Torhausen, do you want to contribute? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. What I think is Im important here is the fact that small states have less interests in many areas than the large states. And this helps them enormously when it comes to prioritization and when they focus on certain issues. I don't think, uh, when speaking about small and large states, uh, we have to move away from the overall influence on the EU structure of the EU framework. For states, basically, or especially small states, it's all about being able to have a say on their key economic issues or on the key economic interests. And if small states can defend their direct economic and political interests and even become active in these areas, one could say that they are successful within the EU. I think it's obvious that the, the, the larger states, they create the overall framework of the EU. But uh, from my point of view, and uh, for, from studies from most academics, if not all, they conclude that the small states are quite efficient in working within the framework created by the larger states. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Claire Adamson. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'd just like to, to examine some of the... Um, the, the statements that have been made about um, a small state and how it positions itself within the EU. I think everyone's talked about the positioning and we'll use the term honest brokers for some and others. But um, Professor Thurhalson, I think, gave a, a, a very great example of how domestic politics can completely influence the EU in terms of he's now in a position where the current government have um, suspended the accession. So obviously domestic politics... Um, there's no, um, there's quite a lot of um, difference in the timing of domestic elections, and I just wonder how much flux there is in that that relationship. And do small states move and negotiate? Is there constant negotiation going on because domestic politics will be influencing the state as it's perceived in Europe all the time? Professor Weivel. I think where, 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 where small states have tended to have, have the most uh, influence have been on, uh, on issues where there's a, a wide uh, uh, political consensus in, uh, in, in domestic politics. Uh, also because you don't have these fluctuations then and you can also work on it continuously and you need to build uh, expertise and you need to build your networks so you cannot choose issues where you have a lot of, of, of fluctuations. You will see that, that the issues where they are most successful, there's continuation from government to government and even, even if the government uh, shifts from conservative to labor or whatever, uh, then, then they will continue working on, on, uh, on, uh, on, on uh, on, on, on the same policies, I think what is what is you might say is, is particular for for for, for small states uh, comparing them to the larger member states is that it's it's not only the domestic politics of their own societies, but it's also the domestic politics of of the, the, their coalition partners, the larger coalition partners that uh, that uh, that matters. And and in in uh, in, in Denmark, we have uh, had experience in in in, uh, in in working, for instance, with the United Kingdom on. On, uh, on, uh, on, on labor market policies in, in, in the European Union. And uh, one of those uh, 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 particular uh, uh, issues, uh, we experienced that, uh, that the kind of domestic politics of the coalition, in, in the, the domestic politics in, in opposition in, in, in the United Kingdom changed. Uh, and that mean, meant that all the nice preparation and work that Denmark had put into this uh, didn't really matter anymore because we were the junior partner in uh, in, in in this. So that's that's something that uh, that small states need to be aware of as well. Yeah, and I think we make, need to make a distinction between the Nordic countries and the southern and eastern European countries. There's a lot of literature on the Nordic countries, which are seeing an exemplary in many ways. But we've also got the eastern European countries, and in the Nordic countries, entering 
the European Union was quite controversial to begin with. There were referendums, quite narrow. Norway decided to stay out. Iceland decided to stay out. But once they're in, there was a consensus about how you act in, in Europe. This is not the case in Central and Eastern Europe, where there was enormous support for going in, but not the same commitment well, once they were in there, not the same degree of organization. So domestic politics gets in the way all the time, which is one reason why they're less effective in Europe than the Nordic countries are. Professor Torhausen. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, to bring in domestic uh, politics. Uh, as you know, all sm the, the small states are not the same. Some are very, very pro-European, while others tend to be quite Euro-skeptic. Uh, and that said, I, th I think it's sometimes we overlook the fact that different political parties work across borders. For example, the Social Democrats work quite closely across borders, and the Social Democrats in Denmark quite maybe quite become quite influential if they work with other Social Democrats across Europe. Just to take an example. The Conservatives do the same, the Liberals do the same. So there are, there are in a way many channels to have, to, to have a say for small states. It's not only about the state and the bureaucracy. There are other channels through political parties, through business, through labor, etc. But bringing in domestic politics is important, of course. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jimmy McGregor. Oh, thank you. Um, you... you in, by your opening statements, you infer that small states have less influence. Uh, does that mean that an independent Scotland, if a member, uh, would have less influence than it does now as part of the UK? Well, that depends on the, whether an independent Scotland would want to pursue different policies. And, and this is a political question. Uh, if Scotland were to perceive that it has different interests, then clearly it would be better off on its own. If it were to end up simply going along with the UK, then independence wouldn't have made much difference. Now, the last time I was here, I mentioned that we have yet to hear about the strategy for an independent Scotland in Europe, and the White Paper is a bit vague about this. They say they'll accept the UK opt-out, the same terms, but there's no vision as to what an independent Scotland might do that is different. So if you think that independent Scotland is going to have the same interests as the rest of the United Kingdom, then you're obviously better as part of a bigger state. But if you think it might have distinct interests, then it would want to pursue those separately. Now, that is a question of political judgment. Thank you. That brings me to my second question then, um, was that if Scotland was able to be independent and, and an independent member of the EU and keep the existing opt-outs and the... The, the, the UK currency, does that, w is, is, would that not lead to her simply being pulled along in the UK direction? Yes, we make that point in the paper. That, that would be to the degree to which you have the same terms as the UK and the same opt-outs, and Europe was moving in a different direction, then you would be dragged along with the rest of the United Kingdom. That's why we want to see what the vision of an independent Scotland in Europe would be and how it might be different from what the UK does at present. I keep going. Yeah, I think um, Professor Tohalson wants in to answer your first two questions, Jimmy. Certainly. Sorry. Sorry, Professor. Professor no, 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 Sorry. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just briefly on, on this, uh, even though I would say that, as I already stated, that small states face structural problems within the EU, I think it's a bit difficult to speak about states having less or more influence in the Union, because in the day-to-day -day decision making, it is all about having a say on your direct economic interests. For example, in Luxembourg, it's all about the financial sector. If Luxembourg is able to shape the EU financial legislations in its favor, that's basically it for Luxembourg. So more or less influential, overall influential, I, I, I'm not that sure that it, it, it helps in, in assessing the role of small states in the EU. I think we, have, we, need, we need to pinpoint their main interests. Thank you very much. Well, um, in some way, but I think it was Professor Keating's evidence states uh, that some research suggests that small states are more likely to end up on the winning side of votes. Uh, could you give us some examples of where this has actually happened? Uh, I'd, I'd have to <laughs> touch my 
brains. I can't, I can't remember a particular example, but there have been statistical analyses which demonstrate this. Now, that's just a statistical analysis, and it doesn't tell you why that is the case, but it seems to reflect the idea that small states would try and get what they can out of a package with the big states and then go along with it. So whatever, uh, you, whatever their votes are worth, they will accept the majority in exchange for some, some concessions, rather than trying to lead an opposition group and being on the, on, on the losing side. It, it, it makes sense. It's true generally in international relations that you're better off on the winning side than on, 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 on the losing side. That seems to be part of it. Now, the question that would need to be explored is what do small states get in return for being on the winning side? And, and it seems that they do get various kinds of concessions and they're taken seriously. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the dominant coalition, the, uh, the winning states, uh, appreciate that they create a good reputation. Uh, there's also, uh, well, I, while I'm talking about reputation, I should say the reputation for being a good European is also important as well, uh, for not being obstructionist. That's important. Uh, and that might also uh, s explain why they would tend to find a place within the winning coalition rather than continually trying to resist things and ending up on the losing side. Have I got any more? Oh. Um, Professor Weivel, um, your, in your written evidence, you suggest that small states have a tendency of hiding and keeping out of trouble. And then later on, you said when you made your opening statement, you said that doesn't really, you know, that's sort of the thing of the past. Um, but would this mean that an independent Scotland would sort of, would have to shy away from taking difficult decisions and, and uh, out of a sense of not rocking the boat? Well, I think that, 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 uh, that if you look at the European Union, then, then, uh, the small states which have been most uh, successful in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in getting influence have been those who have tapped in to kind of the overall dominant political discourse and worked with the, uh, with the big member states. So in that sense you can say they have not rocked the boat or they have only rocked a very small part uh, of the boat where they have their, 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 their particular interests. But I think another side of it in, in, uh, in, 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 in working in, in the European Union is another side of, of being successful and getting influence is also kind of defining your political bastions. Uh, what is it that you think is of utmost uh, political importance? What is it that you're willing to fight for? And what is it, where is it that you're willing to, to be flexible and signal that uh, to the world. I think small states also have a, an advantage uh, because they're small. Sometimes they can uh, be allowed to do something that you would never allow big states uh, to, uh, to, 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 to do. And what they need to do is to signal where is it, what, what is it that is ex ex very important for them and where is it that they, that they will uh, negotiate. And they can pick a few issues where they are, are not willing to negotiate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got Patricia Ferguson next. Patricia. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I think it's fair to say, if I were to summarise the opinions of all three of you, that you believe that a small state needs to um, specialise, needs to build knowledge and leadership in that area, needs to network and build alliances, and needs to prioritise the areas it wants to be involved in. That sounds to me as though it would be quite resource intensive. Can you give us any idea of the kind of resource that some of our smaller states who are successful in working in that way uh, devote to their uh, presence and their, their influence in the EU? I, I think that, uh, that uh, what the other side of it is also that uh, you, you focus on some narrow areas. So it's resource intensive, but it's not a resource intensive on a, on a, on a broad spectrum. It's resource intensive in, 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 in selected issue areas. And the issue areas you select are those where you, uh, where you typically uh, not only have an interest, but also where you have expertise. Because if you do not have that expertise, you will also not be able to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to get influence. So in that sense, I, I think it, it's, uh, it's the resources for most of the small states, uh, they're not insurmountable, uh, because you, 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 you pick the issues where you, uh, where, 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 where you focus. But I think the real kind of uh, uh, challenge, as I also touched upon earlier, is kind of to 
to uh, to to find the talent uh, and, uh, and 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 to get the talent to 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 go to Brussels and to signal that that this is a a career path which is uh, which is important for both politicians and for 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 for, for civil servants. Other two professors like to comment. Mr. Tohalson. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't have exact numbers, uh, but the permanent representations of small states in Brussels tend to be much smaller than the permanent representations uh, of the larger states. And I've, I've often been amazed of how much these small permanent represent, representations can achieve. And what, how, uh, how, did, how do they do it? I mean, in the, in the larger public administration, things tend to be much more formal. All decisions need to be taken in formal meetings. The, the, the friends have a very strict bureaucracy. Same is basically about Westminster. When it comes to small states, they have to work in informal manners within the administration by using flexibility, informality, maneuver of officials, as I have just mentioned. This is of fundamental importance in order for them to be able to cope with, with the EU burden. I can understand perfectly the, the, the points that are being made about that. But I wonder if we take um, Professor Arthur Hallison's um, example of Luxembourg concentrating on the financial sector, for example, and wanting to prioritise the benefit it gets from any protection or any measures that are put in place around that sector. Does that then imply that small states who have those kinds of very specific interests have to almost forego having any kind of impact on other areas that might be being dealt with within the EU? Well, that's... The, 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 sorry, sorry, Valdea, go on. Valdea, no, you, you started. Sorry, you on your yeah, briefly, uh, uh, yeah, this, the small states need to simply decide to set a number of issues on the side. And uh, some small states within the EU don't even send officials to some meetings within the Commission. They, they don't want to admit, admit to this publicly. Uh, but th this, this is the fact they simply don't have the manpower. That said, this may not hurt the interests at all because they simply prioritise meetings of importance. Yeah, I think this is, this, this is true. But another point is that it's important for small countries that the domestic administration be Europeanised as well. So instead of just having a separate group of people to look after Europe, you can't afford it. Uh, and this may even help them to learn a bit more about Europe. There's also a certain amount of, of learning. You get involved in European networks. You learn a lot about policy issues. And because small countries need to do this, they're sometimes very good at it. Not just because they're small, because some small countries do it badly, but well-organized small countries can actually use Europe as a policy resource back home as well as contributing to Europe. But that doesn't alter your main point, which is absolutely valid. There is a, the, there is a resource cost here. Um, one other thing that I, I wanted to ask, which is related, but off at a slight tangent, and that is in terms of small states and um, the allocation of commissioners, um, I think I'm right in saying that small states and big states all get to have a commissioner. <coughs> but would the, it, it seems to me to suggest, though, that given the weight that larger states have, that they might pick the most interesting and most important um, areas to have their commissioners in. Would, would I be right in that, or is that not how it operates? I, I don't know, so I'm, I'm really interested to know what the story is with that. Well, I think that the, I think there's, if you look at the the, the, the history of the uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of the commission, uh, I think sometimes uh, small states have actually held uh, some of the uh, of, of the most important uh, posts in in, 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 in in the commission. I think there are uh, uh, one of of the uh, of kind of 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 of, of, uh, of the important factors is of course how much clout do we have in 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 the European Union and uh, and uh, of course the bigger member states 
have more than 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 than, than, than the small ones. So in that sense, you can say you're you 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 are disadvantaged from the beginning. But also, uh, what is important in in, uh, in 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 the commission is who you put forward uh, to become a commissioner. Is it someone who has uh, a proven record of uh, of, uh, of of international expertise, of uh, being an effective uh, uh, negotiator, of uh, having a, a, an important standing in in, in 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 one particular issue areas, be it fisheries or, or agriculture or, 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 or trade or. Or, or whatever. So in that sense, uh, uh, expertise uh, matters uh, uh, as well. Is it somebody who, who has held uh, uh, posts uh, of importance uh, uh, before? This, and somebody with, with experience, which shows that this person uh, will probably fit nicely within the uh, the commission. Uh, uh, that matters uh, uh, as well. Uh, I think sometimes uh, also, and I think. Uh, there are examples of, of small states thinking about this uh, uh, strategically. Uh, there's also a, 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 an, an implicit gender balance in, 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 in the commissioner. Uh, so sometimes you might want to think about that when you put forward a, a, a candidate for the, uh, for, 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 for the commission. So I think you're right to say uh, that uh, all things equal, uh, a big member state has a, has a better chance uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of getting an important post than a small uh, uh, member state. But, uh, but all thi fortunately, all things are not always equal, and, and, and small states can do when they do stuff themselves uh, that mean that, that sometimes they will get actually uh, uh, important posts in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the commission. And then there's also the balance between uh, the big member states, because the big member states, they might sometimes uh, be more willing uh, to let a small a, a, a commissioner from a small member state uh, hold an important post than a, than a, a commissioner from another big uh, member state. And then finally, it's important to remember also that those commissioners are not representatives of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of member states. As soon as they are in the commission, you know they are they are expected to to act in 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 in, in the interest of Europe and not in the interest of the home country. Yes, I, I think that's, that's right. There, there there is an informal rule about balancing big states and small states, and the big states not taking all the big positions. So at the moment, the president of the commission, the president of the council, they're both from small states, because the big states couldn't agree that another of them would, would get it. Uh, and there's also the question of ideological and party balances mm. becoming more important. So the next president of the commission will reflect in some vague way the result of the European elections. So it becomes between the centre-left and the centre-right. And there's an effort to get a balance there as well. So in other words, like most situations in politics, your connections are almost as important as uh, your expertise. I would say if a small state sent a trusted, knowledgeable uh, expert to Brussels in the field of interest, he or she stands a good chance of getting the post that the government really wants. And just an example, uh, Norway, when it last time made an accession treaty uh, with the EU, it had been decided that Norway would get the Commissioner of Fisheries. That was the field that Norway really wanted, and it had been prom promised it. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, and good morning to, to everyone. Uh, I'd like to continue to pursue the, the, the discussion about the ways that smaller states seek to gain influence for, for themselves within the, the European Union. Um, some time ago, I, I had the opportunity to ask Ireland's current Minister of State for European Affairs, Pascal Donoghue, about Ireland's relationship within the European Union and its relationship with the United Kingdom from a historical perspective. And his statement to me was that, in his, in his country's view, Ireland had greatly benefited from its independence as, as, as a state, but that it had enhanced its relationship with the United Kingdom, but its participation in Europe as a small state gave it further advantages because of the necessity 
to engage and interact with other small states within the European Union. Is, is this something that's, in your view, m more prevalent in Europe now, where smaller states are having to negotiate with one another and make the connections, I think, that Patricia Ferguson referred to, and do they do that much more systematically than the bigger states do? Well, well Ireland does it pretty well because when they went in at the same time as the United Kingdom, they were tied into British markets in all sorts of ways. Europe allowed them to diversify their export markets, and so in that sense, it enhanced their independence. They'd been formally independent since 1922, but highly tied to the United Kingdom. Uh, on, on the other hand, there were huge challenges that faced Ireland. They had an awful lot of learning to do. Now, it was a successful example of a country sending people to Brussels, knowing their way around Europe, reorganizing their domestic policy, and Europe indeed was probably a dynamic force in improving the quality of their domestic administration. You get some other countries in Central and Eastern Europe that haven't done that and have performed very badly. So it does depend on the individual country and how well it is, as it, it, it is prepared to deal with Europe. You asked for views from Professor Tarlson. Yeah, uh, I would say in the day-to-day -day decision making in the Union, uh, alliance formation is based on economic interests. It's all based on economic interests. However, when it comes to treaty negotiations, intergovernmental conferences, in the last few years we have seen a split between the large states on the one hand and the small states on the other. And there it has been, there it has been very Im important for small states to stand together in, in order to prevent, what I would say, the attempt of a large states to enhance their say within the Union. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that the, the experience is that, that, that coalition building is, is, uh, is, is, is typically issue specific uh, and based on, on uh, both economic interests and, and, and also political interests. Uh, so for instance, uh, Denmark uh, will work with, with, uh, with Germany on, 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 on climate issues, but with Britain on, on, on labor market issues, because those are the, the, the most natural uh, coalition partners in, in terms of what the political consensus is in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Denmark. Only when it comes to some institutional issues, as, as Baldur mentioned, then we'll see kind of a, a, a broader coalition of, uh, of small states, because they have a, a, a common interest. But even then, sometimes, uh, uh, political uh, ideas and, 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 uh, and differences uh, may play in. Some might want a stronger role for the European Commission uh, than, than others. Some have a more intergovernmental uh, approach. Uh, some, uh, some have a, a, a more uh, supernatural uh, 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 supranational uh, uh, approach. So, so, so it's not so much small, big, but I would say more, more uh, political and, and, and economic interests that tend to, 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 to play a role for coalition building. Okay. On, on, the, on the question about numbers, we, there's been many comments this morning about numbers and they are important or they're not Im, important. Um, it's my understanding that when Scotland becomes an independent state, our members of the European Parliament will, will almost double to be on a par, perhaps with Denmark's representation. Um, but Professor Keating, you were talking about Scotland's agenda in Europe and what exactly will it be and will it diverge from the UK or will it be the same and so on and so forth. But in terms of the Council of Ministers, when we get there, we'll have, we'll have one member each, I presume the UK will have one member and Scotland will have one member. In the Council of Ministers? Aye. No, the, well, an independent Scotland would, would send a, a minister to the Council of Ministers depending on the subject. The system of voting is being changed, as a note in my paper, so it's a qualified majority of countries with a qualified majority of population. So countries, as of this year, will, will no longer have a fixed number of votes. But it remains the case that bigger countries will, will have bigger, more votes because they have, they have more population. Right. And what, in, in terms of where our interests may diverge, and that there's been some examples of that over recent years in fishing and agriculture and common agricultural policy, where I, I think it's fair to say that some have a view in Scotland that our interests were not well served by negotiations carried out on our behalf by the United Kingdom. Scotland, Scotland would surely then have a, an influence and a voice, whereas previously we, we, we had none. 
indeed, at, 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 at present, when the Council of Ministers meets as the Council of Agriculture Ministers, there's usually a Scottish minister present, but as part of a British delegation. Hence, after independence, it would be uh, a Scottish minister representing Scotland, uh, and in that case, they could present a very distinctive Scottish case. Now, then depend on the balance of forces, the balance of, of, of power. Uh, I, I suspect in that area, Scotland might adopt a different line from uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, because United Kingdom governments have been in favour of cutting back both agricultural spending and regional policy spending, and Scotland would probably have a slightly different preference on that. Whether they would effectively represent themselves would depend on how many other countries were prepared to agree with them. And that's when you get back into the politics that we've been talking about. Absolutely. That, that, that presumably is where the, it becomes very important, the kind of relationships you can develop and build, presumably as a small member state, where, where it is in your particular country's interest to do, to do just that, I, I would suggest. Um, Professor Keating, you also talked about some of the main um, strengths, perhaps, that Scotland could, could bring to the table in Europe, and you mentioned fishing. Uh, you mentioned agriculture, oil and gas, and higher education. Um, could, could you offer me an opinion about what you think Scotland's contribution to Europe may be in terms of those relative strengths? Do you think we're well positioned to make a good offer to Europe as a, as a member state um, relative to our size? I mean, do you think we can make a positive contribution, I suppose I'm, I'm asking? And this you. is what, what we've all been saying. It depends on the quality of the policy that you're producing there, and whether this policy is not just lobbying for Scotland, but it's something to offer Europe as a whole. Now, we've got the grand European uh, research frameworks. There's a lot of money going into research. Uh, for example, Scotland might have something to contribute there because it's got an effective research sector, which is very well inter internationalized, much better than some other European uh, countries. Uh, there's a lot of expertise in, in, in the universities. Uh, on agricultural policy, They've been trying to reform the common agricultural policy ever since it was set up. It's a very, very slow process. But Scotland has had within the United Kingdom a disproportionate number of people working on agricultural policy, back to the days of the Scottish office. So there is something that Scotland might want to contribute. And then on uh, uh, energy, there's the oil and gas experience, of, of, of course. But there's also all the work that's going on in renewable energy in Scotland, which tends to be supported ac across the parties. So it's, it's not a partisan issue, but it's something where Scotland is seen to have an advantage. Uh, but this can only be done on a European level, because a lot of this framework is set by Europe. A lot of the rules are set by Europe, the competition rules and so on. Uh, and so it's very important for the renewable energy sector in Scotland that, uh, that, that, that there be international cooperation, let's put it that way with the rest of the United Kingdom, with the rest of Europe, because Scotland can't just do that on its own. Could I ask a view from the other two professors, please, just on the, the, what you see as the strengths that Scotland can bring to the European Union as an independent member? Well, I, I, obviously, I, I do not know so much about uh, uh, Scotland as, as, as Professor Keating or, or as, uh, as, as, as as the committee uh, members, but I would say in, in, in general, it is where you have the uh, the, the 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 expertise uh, and uh, and the knowledge, and where you have resources, not only resources in the uh, in 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 in, in, in uh, state administration and in, in politics, but one thing also to uh, to 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 consider is the resources that uh, that uh, that kind of the third sector or private sector uh, is willing to 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 send to Brussels because uh, it it. It does matter uh, how much your your in, your your kind of uh, interest groups uh, are on the ground in Brussels as well, and how much are they willing and and able to uh, to, to 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 network. So that's certainly a thing to 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 consider as uh, as as part of the the, the package as well. Professor Fahlsen, do you have a? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think this will basically depend on who will be in power in Scotland, who governs at its, its time. I mean, the Scottish National Party might uh, prioritise very differently from, the, from Labour or the Liberals if they would form a coalition in, in the Scottish National uh, Parliament, Scotland being an independent state. 
So it depends on the, I mean, the, the governing coalition back home. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, the Scottish National Party might like to focus environment, closer cooperation with the Nordic states on peacekeeping mission, development assistance, just to take an, just to take an example. The, the Conservatives align more with the rest of the UK, be a bit more Eurosceptic, I, I, I don't know. So there is an option there. It's not like that Scotland would always have to follow the same path as a member state. The Scot uh, voters basically will decide what will, in the end, be the Scottish priorities within Brussels. That's a, a very, very illuminating point of view. Thank you very much for that, Professor. Thanks, convener. Quick supplementary from Jamie and then Rod. Just on that, uh, well, you mentioned Ireland particularly there, um, which obviously we know did very well from when it joined the, um, the, the EU. Uh, albeit she's suffered rather badly lately. Um, if she was joining today, uh, would she benefit in the same way that she did then, or are the benefits now rather diluted? Well, Ireland benefited in the 1990s from the agricultural spending and, to a lesser extent, from the structural funds. At one point, these accounted for 6% of Ireland's GDP. I looked the figure up yesterday for other reasons. That's why I have it in my head. That has tailed off because Ireland is prosperous now and it's not eligible for all that kind of spending. But the other benefit from Ireland was exports being part of the single market, attracting inward investment from American and uh, Asian firms that went there because Ireland was part of the single market. Had Ireland not joined the European Union, a lot of that investment would not be there. Now, the Irish economy collapsed because of some very bad decisions taken by the, by, 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 by Irish governments and a failure to adapt to the implications of joining the euro. So they allowed a boom to get out of hand. This was a, a very bad way of dealing with a particular European policy, namely uh, the euro. Uh, but despite the crash and despite the terrible problems of the Irish economy uh, recently, I think most people would accept that it has been a lot better within the European Union than it would have been without outside it. My question, my question was, would it have had the same... If it had joined today, would it have got the same you know, result in, in terms of... Um, yeah, well, it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been the same Ireland, because if it had joined today, had it stayed out, if, if it had joined today, you're saying it would have stayed out for the last 40 years, it would have been in a much worse state. Uh, and, but but, but uh, uh, there's a lot of Euroscepticism in Ireland. There's a lot of Euroscepticism uh, everywhere. Uh, but the notion that Ireland would be better off outside altogether, I think, would be accepted by very few people. Now, would it, would it vote to go in today? Uh, would, it, would a referendum on Europe win anywhere in Europe at the moment? Uh, is, is, uh, Europe is in, a, is in a very bad position. Uh, but most people who've studied it would say, yes, it would still be in the correct decision to, to, to go in. Now, I should say, just to add to that, the reason they went in is that they felt they had no choice because Britain went in they were tied to the British market. That is no longer the case. If Britain were to come out, Ireland would stay in. There's no doubt about it, because they see that they've gained from Europe a great deal right across the board. Okay, I've got a quick supplementary from Hans Alla and then finish me, Rod. Sorry, Rod. <laughs> it's uh, on that point. So. Thank you. No, it's just a, it's actually a couple of supplementaries. One, um, when you asked... Um, Two questions from the panel, and one was, would it bring strength to Scotland joining the European Union? And I'm, I want to create a balance there to say, would there be any weaknesses? So, so, so you mean Scotland being independent within the European Union, yes. as opposed to being... Uh, Part of the UK. Well, yes, because there are some points we've made about the disadvantages of being a small state, namely that you have less weight in some of the big negotiations and because you don't have the capacity to operate right across the board. The question is, is it worth losing that in favour of the advantages? And this is a matter of political judgment uh, at the end of the day. Um, small states can succeed, uh, but they're constrained, and if they are to succeed, they've got to know how to do it they don't automatically succeed. They can do well or they can do badly, depending on how well they're organized. I, 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 I think it's fair to say 
that it, it takes years for all new member states to adopt to the reality of the EU and work within its decision-making process. That said, Scotland is, of course, a member of the European Union at present. And Scotland not, or Scotland or the UK has, or there are several Scottish officials working on EU matters right now. So Scotland is in a, in a way in a very different position compared to the, to the member states that have joined in, in the past. So I would probably say that Scotland is much better prepared for membership than the others. That, that said, of course, there are certain weaknesses, as we have already covered, and it's need to be tackled, and then it all comes down, from my point of view, to administrative competence. Okay, thank you. First of all. I think one uh, one issue to, to that is important to remember is that uh, when it comes to an independent Scotland versus uh, uh, Scotland as, as as part of the United Kingdom and the European Union, how much it will 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 will, will benefit or cost also depends on, on on how much your your policies will diverge from uh, from from the current position of the and future position of uh, of, uh, of of the United Kingdom because of course as a small state you have some structural disadvantages that you need to overcome but if you have on the other hand if you have some policy preferences which are very different uh, uh, from the ones that are, 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 are po UK policies now then the, you might have a benefit because you can pursue those those policy preferences more directly Rod Campbell Rod um, uh, thank you, convener. I think because there's lots of session already and lots of other questions have been answered, a lot of the questions they would have answered have now been uh, commented on by the panel. Um, in particular, the one, uh, obviously, we weren't starting from um, point zero. Um, uh, if, if I can just uh, start with you, Professor Keating, though, just following on uh, a little bit from what you said to Willie Coffey about the position in the Council of Ministers and voting. Um, if an independent Scotland chooses and has closely allied on the issue with uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, it votes with it. If it has a different view, accepting that it might need to prioritise and do the networking and all the other issues which you raised this morning, uh, it would be in a better position to get what an independent Scotland wants as a priority than the current situation. So we're not going to be worse off than we are now in, in, in that sense, are we? That's right. Uh, I think I have a mind around that. You think... Uh, that, that, that. If, 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 we, if we have the same interest as the rest of the UK, we vote with the rest of the UK. If we don't, uh, with all the caveats you've said about um, kind of the need to network and prioritising and influencing, uh, we're in a position to, to uh, vote and represent our interest in a different way, where it diverges. So Essentially, that's true, but there's a complication, which is that in the Council of Ministers or in the preparation for the Council of Ministers, because the Council of Ministers doesn't actually vote an awful lot because deals are done before the formal vote comes about. There are all kinds of trade-offs. So I'll give you something and you'll give me something and you'll give them something. So all kinds of negotiations there. So it's not simply the case of saying, we differ on this particular issue from you, therefore we're going to vote a different direction. We norm you normally work that out and make some kind of compromise uh, in, in advance. Uh, and would Scotland be better off doing that on its own as opposed to being part of the United Kingdom, it gets back to the point that's just being made. It depends whether you think that Scotland has different interests. And, and that's, that's what this debate on independence is all about, really, whether you think Scotland wants to do things differently or whether you think things are more appropriately done on the UK for the UK as a whole. Translate that into Europe. It's the same, it's the same question again. Um, does anybody else want to comment on that in the panel? Uh, could I just, uh, sorry, Oops. it's just a noise, <laughs> so uh, finally I'll say in view of the time, perhaps I could just refer to another academic who's not here, Professor Diana uh, Panka, uh, apologies to her if I pronounced her surname wrong, from the University of Freiburg. Um, she seems to be very much in line with the comments that have been made this morning, but she did, just by way of emphasis, say that uh, on matters of influence, um, levels of activity and levels of influence are closely connected and, again, not attributable to size alone. Small states with active diplomats are more likely to influence EU directives than states with less active diplomats. Any comments on that? 
I think I think that's that's that that's very true, and I I, I think the uh, the uh, the experience of, of small states in the European Union also shows that uh, it is the, it is those which are well prepared, uh, those who have the 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 expertise, and also those who are, are significantly also those who are flexible uh, enough. Uh, to act fast and also uh, also be tap into the policy process very early on, uh, which which will uh, gain influence. That does not mean that the structural disadvantages that we've pointed to are, are without importance, but it does mean that on selected issues that they can actually be be overcome. Come on, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think the uh, Panka description is accurate. Uh, and on the f former question, if I just may, I, I think UK at present being one of the big players in the EU and it is able to exercise some influence like in fields of security and defence and uh, form the framework of the EU uh, itself. However, when it comes to Scotland and it, its position as an independent state within the EU, I think it will be it would have difficulties in forming the overall framework. But that said, I don't see any reason why Scotland should not be should not be able to do as well as Denmark or Sweden or Finland. Yeah, um, that concludes our evidence from our first panel this morning. Can I take this opportunity on behalf of the committee to say thank you very much to all of you, to uh, both of you for coming along to the committee today, and for Professor Tohalson for coming in from Iceland. We really appreciate the effort that you have all taken to attend committee today and um, informing us as we go along with inquiry. I'm going to briefly suspend for a few minutes. I hope members will be back in their seats in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, and welcome back to this, the fourth meeting of the European External Relations Committee and the continuation of our evidence on the Scottish Government's white paper in Scotland's place in Europe. Um, we have our second panel today, well, our second one-person panel um, today is Brandon Malone, who is a solicitor advocate. And I believe, Brandon, you want to do a quick opening statement and introduce yourself. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, the invitation to give evidence uh, to the committee this morning. Uh, I'll set out my, my background and uh, my interest in this to give context to what I'm, I'm going to say. Um, as you said, I'm a lawyer, uh, and my background is in uh, commercial dispute resolution. Uh, I'm a partner in a commercial law firm uh, with offices in, in Scotland and London. Uh, I'm the, the chairman of the Scottish Arbitration Centre. Uh, I have a strong interest in constitutional law, uh, and I'm a member of the, the Law Society's uh, Constitutional Law Subcommittee. Uh, my main area of interest is dispute resolution. Uh, I'm an honorary lecturer at the University of Dundee, an external examiner uh, in arbitration at Robert Gordon University, and I'm also a visiting lecturer at Universities of Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Strathclyde, all in dispute resolution topics. Um, and I would say that dispute resolution has a, a direct bearing uh, on the matter at hand. Um, I stress that I'm appearing this morning in a purely personal capacity, and I'm not representing any of the organisations uh, that I've mentioned there. Uh, I should also declare, uh, if it's not already obvious from the, the note uh, that is appended to the Business for Scotland article, that I am uh, a supporter of Scottish independence, and that uh, obviously uh, should be declared up front. Uh, that note uh, that you'll have in the papers is uh, an adaptation of an article uh, that was published in the, by, in the Journal of the Law Society of Scotland in November. Uh, it is not a direct uh, response to the call for evidence, uh, and I should make that clear, uh, but I do say that it has a bearing uh, on what we're looking at today, which from my point of view is uh, whether uh, Article 48 or Article 49 uh, would be the correct uh, route uh, for transition uh, to European membership for Scotland, and I'm, I'm happy to expand my, route on, my, my views on that. Uh, my uh, view is that Article 48 is a suitable route, uh, and that in fact it's the, the only realistic way of ensuring Scotland's membership of the EU on a continuing and uninterrupted basis uh, to ensure uh, continuity of effect of the existing arrangements, uh, and that that is clearly in the best interest of the people of Scotland, but also uh, of the former United Kingdom, as it would be by then, uh, and uh, the other members of the European Union. Um, I started to, to set out my views in, in detail why I considered Article 48 to be the appropriate route, uh, but um, then I read Graham Avery's written an oral evidence, um, and I find that uh, he has expressed uh, my thinking on it uh, far more authoritatively than, than I would be able to do, so I, I would simply endorse his reasoning, and I don't have very much to add to what he said. Uh, and I've also been greatly influenced in my thinking by uh, Sir David uh, Edward QC. Um, there are five points I'd like to make, and then I'm happy to be questioned on these points and the points that there might be in relation to the paper that I put in. Uh, the first is that, in my view, uh, the UK government and many commentators on this EU question are looking at this issue through the wrong end of the telescope, which is to say that they are looking at the question as to how international law would apply to a Scotland which is already independent. Um, when in reality, the main issues, to my mind, are the relationship between Scotland and the rest of the UK between a yes vote, the referendum, uh, and the date of independence and the principles that would govern uh, the division of assets and liabilities and how international relationships would be dealt with. Uh, and also the duties of the UK government towards Scotland within that period uh, between the vote and independence. Uh, and I, my view is that this has come about really because of the way that the UK government papers on these questions have been framed. Uh, my second point is that from the perspective of the EU and its member states, there is a major difference in principle between the accession of a new state, which has not been part of Europe, uh, and the division of an existing member state, my third point is that there is also a major difference in principle between the secession of part of an existing member state on a unilateral basis and the democratic and constitutional division of a state into two parts by an act of parliament of the original state, which is what would happen in Scotland's case. 
Uh, my fourth point uh, is that the people of Scotland ought to be entitled to assume that the UK Government will support Scotland's membership of the EU and that during the period between yes, a yes vote and independence, the UK Government will take steps to facilitate a seamless entry for Scotland into the EU so far as that is within their power. Uh, and that takes me to my final point, which is that the UK Government ought to be approaching the question of Scotland's membership of the EU on the basis that the UK has been a joint endeavour and that so far as possible Scotland ought to be entitled to share in the benefits of that joint endeavour, including EU membership on the terms currently enjoyed by the UK and that the UK should be approaching the EU with a view to obtaining continuity of effect of the existing UK position, including its opt-outs uh, and a continuing rebate for Scotland. And so for all of those reasons, I say the UK Government should, prior to the referendum, as I allude to in my article, uh, state whether in principle it wants Scotland to be an EU member at the point of independence, whether in principle it will make an application to the EU under Article 48 with a view to achieving that, whether in principle it supports Scotland obtaining the same opt-outs as the UK and a rebate on the same basis as the UK. Uh, and as part of that, uh, because, it's, uh, because of the necessity of setting out the position on currency, uh, the UK Government should also state in principle whether it is in favour of or opposed to uh, a sterling zone. Uh, now, none of that, in my view, constitutes pre-negotiation. That is simply setting out a principled position so that voters can make an informed choice, as, the, uh, uh, as many bodies have, have called for, uh, including, including the Law Society and its paper. So those are my initial thoughts, um, and I'm very happy to take questions on those or the, or the, uh, the paper that was submitted. Thanks very much, Mr Malone. Mr Malone, you, you mentioned briefly there um, Article 48 and Article 49 and the subsequent evidence that, that this committee has heard and other people have written about in articles and, and blogs. And the articles are actually pretty silent on um, the situation that Scotland is currently in. It's unprecedented in any other um, situation across Europe, whether it be successions or accessions um, or indeed in Greenland's uh, um, uh, instance um, leaving the, the EU. Do, do you see any challenges in the fact that there's a silence there or do you see that as an opportunity to fill that silence? Well, it is without precedent. There is no direct precedent regardless of, of what people are saying. Um, the, uh, 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 certainly, as, as Mr Avery went into in some detail, uh, as did Sir David, the, the European Union is a flexible body uh, and I would expect uh, that they will find a solution, uh, and the obvious solution is, is Article 48, because Article 49 involves Scotland being out with Europe uh, and applying to get in, so that process can't even really begin until Scotland is independent. So that leaves a period uh, outside of Europe, uh, and that is in uh, no one's interests, uh, as, as Mr Avery set out very clearly, uh, and I don't think uh, that would be the way to go um, Article 48 on the face of it allows something like this. Um, I think it's fair to say that it wasn't drafted with this in mind, but it does allow uh, member states uh, to apply for uh, a, a revision of the treaties. Uh, now, you'll have heard an evidence, I've, I've read the evidence in the reports, uh, that the revision to the treaties required are not terribly great. Um, I think Sir David basically set out or drafted an amendment to the, the Treaty of, of Europe. Um, obviously, the, the treaty the functioning of Europe is slightly more difficult, but again, Mr Avery set out the relatively few areas where there would have to be uh, a difference. Uh, but this comes back to my point that um, what we are talking about here is the division of an existing state, uh, and therefore the impact on the other states uh, ought not to be nearly as great as the accession of a new member, uh, either financially or, or really an impact on, on voting terms. There will obviously have to be an adjustment in representation. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, one of the points that you, that you had um, uh, picked up as well was the principled position um, and not that, that it's not a pre-negotiation. Do you think that the UK, uh, in good faith, in compliance with its agreement, um, that it signed in the Edinburgh Agreement, particularly the last paragraph of the Edinburgh Agreement. Do you think that principled position should be a pragmatic way forward for the UK to set at rest some of the minds who are claiming uncertainty? 
Um, well, I, I think it goes beyond the, the Edinburgh Agreement. Obviously, the Edinburgh Agreement, um, uh, <clears throat> whether that's an obligation to act in good faith or, or, or however you want to interpret that. I mean, I think the point is, the point I would make is that for the, uh, the last, the overriding principle, in my view, is that the last 300 years, uh, Scotland has been in a union uh, and that you have, uh, over that period, there have been a number of in in intangible assets built up. Say assets in the very broad sense of that word, not cash assets, obviously, or physical assets, but one of those assets is the international relationships that the UK enjoys. Um, and the UK's membership of the EU and the, and the basis of that membership is plainly one of those assets in the broad sense of that word and has significant value. Uh, and, and so I don't see any reason in principle why uh, that ought not to be uh, divided up in a fair way and that that ought to be uh, the, the process that informs uh, or the principle that informs the discussions that would take place between a yes vote and Independence Day. Okay, happy to go to open questions. Rod Campbell. Uh, thank you for your comprehensive opening statement. Uh, I probably want you to recap slightly on what you, what you said about uh, matters which uh, I think the UK government could clarify which wouldn't constitute pre-negotiations. But before I do that, could I just uh, ask you uh, uh, whether you think the, or agree with me that to some extent some of the comments being made by the UK government at the present time, particularly in relation to currency, for example, constituted perhaps an opening shot in negotiations? I think it constitutes a negotiating position. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. Um, I, I think um, w w my view on this is that the position of the UK government presently serves two purposes for them. I suppose um, one is that it preserves the negotiating position without giving anything away, but the second is it also creates a great deal of uncertainty, uh, and of course, uh, uncertainty. Uh, is, is a benefit to them uh, in that uh, people want certainty. Uh, there's a great call for certainty from business, from the law society, from various bodies, from the electrical commission. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, uh, as, I, as I set out in my paper, my article, uh, that people aren't being provided with that principled position. Uh, I don't see why the UK government uh, is unable uh, to say uh, what, that in principle, it's, you, know, you don't expect them to negotiate on the detail, but that in principle it is in favour of a sterling zone, or that in principle uh, it is in favour uh, of Scotland having continuing membership uh, of the EU. Uh, and frankly, um, I'm, uh, I, I am disturbed that there hasn't been uh, that, certainly in relation to the EU, I'm, I'm disturbed there hasn't been that immediate uh, confirmation that the UK would be in favour of Scotland inheriting that current set of rights. There are just, could you just recap, I think, for my benefit, nobody else's, the matters which you think there should be a clear statement on from the UK government? Yes. Um, <coughs> yeah, so... My points were that the UK government should, prior to the referendum date, state whether, in principle, it wants Scotland to be an EU member at the point of independence, whether, in principle, it will make an application to the EU under Article 48 with a view to achieving that, whether, in principle, it supports Scotland obtaining the same opt-outs as the UK and a rebate on the same basis as the UK. And as I say, because the currency question is, is tied to the practicalities, the weather in principle, it's in favour of a sterling zone. Now, I appreciate that's going probably slightly beyond the remit of uh, the Article 48, Article 49 question, but uh, I do think that these things are tied pretty closely together. I that. I just, in view of the time, I'll let others in. Thank you for that. Okay, other colleagues got questions? Willie Coffey? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, Mr Malone. Um, in terms of the debate between Article 48 and 49, there was considerable discussion at the previous committee involving some of your learned colleagues 
I asked them specifically, three of those colleagues who preferred the 49 route, to indicate clearly to me which, which uh, article in the treaty the European Union uh, gave, gave provision for that to happen, for Scotland to leave the European Union. And I would have to say that I was not clear what article they were referring to. It's my view, but I would appreciate your view, that there is no such article that sees Scotland in a position where it is outside the European Union. So, first of all, could you, could you comment on that, please? Yes. Um, the, the, the treaty doesn't make provision for part of a member state to leave. It's not envisaged. Um, the argument, as it's advanced by those who say that Scotland would be out with the, the EU, is, um, I suppose, in a way a semantic argument, but they're saying simply Scotland would not then be part of a member state and would not then be part of, of the Union. That's the start and finish of their argument. I think it was Mr Avery who said that, well, that's, uh, that may be true uh, in, in that particular context, but there's a much wider question. <laughs> Um, the problem we have is that uh, if you simply uh, allow that uh, to proceed, if there's no efforts on the part uh, of the UK to maintain continuity, you end up with a position where, uh, arguably, and there are counter-arguments, but arguably Scotland is then uh, out with the EU, although arguably its citizens remain citizens of the EU. Uh, now, that uh, has been uh, variously described uh, as unthinkable and absurd, absurd by both Mr Avery and Sir David, uh, and I would tend to agree with that. Um, the, uh, I, I saw that the proponents of the Article um, 49 uh, route, um, particularly P Professor Armstrong, was suggesting that uh, you could have some sort of provisional arrangement uh, after an application was, was made. The application can only be made um, of course, uh, after the date of independence, because it can only be made by a state. Now, the, now you could equally say that Article 49 is, is not designed to deal with, a, with a, an entity that has been in Europe for the last 40 years. I mean, it, it goes through procedures which, when you read it, are clearly directed at uh, a country which has never been part of Europe. So it's not uh, directly suited to this either. But it is this, this interim period that would be the problem, that would create this absurdity. Um, and I know that Professor Armstrong was suggesting, well, you could have some sort of interim arrangement uh, between Scotland and the European Union. Uh, but I think it was Mr Avery who was suggesting uh, that, um, that, in fact, to work that out would be as difficult, if not more difficult, with more difficult consequences in terms of the, the areas not covered by Europe uh, than actually getting through uh, uh, membership under Article 48. Um, I, I, there are these competing views. Um, it, is, it is a difficult task. Um, I mean, I'm, as I say, the, the, involved in, in dispute resolution, um, and you have to weigh up these things. I do it as an arbitrator, weighing up experts, and that's, that's a difficult area. Um, uh, and you will all be well able to evaluate evidence and come to a view. Um, when I'm doing that, um, I'm looking at the factors of relevant experience, authority and impartiality. Now, I don't claim to be impartial. I've said that up front. Uh, but uh, having read all the reports, what struck me that uh, with Sir David Edward and Graeme Avery, you have the benefit of two witnesses that have been at the very heart of Europe for a long time. Uh, and they both have very great uh, authority. And unlike me, they're, they're both impartial for this purpose. Mr Avery made it clear that he doesn't favour other side, and Sir David said that he is a, a moderate unionist. Um, so um, to the extent that they are arguing in favour of a smooth transition for Scotland, um, I think if I were evaluating that evidence, I would attach a lot of weight to those two particular witnesses. Can I pursue the, the notion that, that 49 is the route, just for a wee moment. I don't believe it myself personally, but can I just pursue that with you for a, for a moment and use your, your expertise? There's a, there's a kind of implicit assumption that the putting Scotland out of the European Union can be very quick and almost be overnight, but the coming back in could take years. And I've, I've not understood that. There, there are effectively two, process, pro, two processes in place there. 
there's a going out and a coming back in. And there's been no discussion about what the terms of going out might mean, because, uh, as I believe, there is no provision for that to happen. But nevertheless, people who propose that as a solution have to articulate what the going out process might mean. Uh, the only precedent we have, I think, uh, was it Greenland that took about six or seven years to get out of the European Union. So in that context, I can't understand how those who support the 49 route can, can claim that Scotland's exit from the European Union before it can come back in could be a very quick process and the process of coming back in could be a very long one. Yes, well, I mean, it would be a horrendous mess for the clear, re clear reasons set out uh, by Sir David and Graham Avery. I mean, it would be a logistical nightmare um, and would involve more work in the preparation for that and then reapplication and, 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 and covering the interim procedures than it would be uh, in uh, obtaining a smooth transition and, uh, and ensuring continuity of effect. As I say, from the point of view of the rest of Europe, now, no doubt they have their own interest. But uh, in terms of continuity, if you simply switch over the existing UK situation uh, into a, uh, a, and, and divide that up, as it were, then the only real impact uh, on uh, European, other European members uh, in, the, in the shorter term is uh, a change in, in, in voting patterns and, and a slight, well, an increase in representation uh, between Scotland and the former UK. Uh, as between the UK previously, because there would be obviously Scotland's waiting as an independent state, it would it would have uh, more voting right. rights proportionately. Okay, many thanks for that. Let others come in, convener. Thank you. Okay, Hans Alan Malik. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you, you've you've said that uh, in principle the UK government needs to do several things, uh, in, in an absence of. Uh, no result of a, a referendum. I think the British government is taking the view that there is no yes vote yet, so we don't need to do anything. And the European Union is also refusing to speak to the Scottish government. So therefore, nothing is going to happen till such times as that referendum takes place. Now, once a referendum takes place and we do have a, a time gap in which then things need to be done, either or not, and if they need to be done, um, whilst you're saying in principle the British government has to do anything, they don't have to do anything. And that's the, that's the, that's the uh, worrying issue because they quite simply might say, well, they may even say we don't want you to join the European Union. If they do that, we're not getting in, whether we like it or not. So um, first of all, let me try and confirm if, if that's factual or not. Well, you, 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 two questions yes. there. The first was uh, whether the... Uh, or the, you seem to be assuming that the UK will not take a position on any of these things prior to the referendum. I think that would be very un unfortunate. I've said that. I mean, um, that's, the, that's the line they're pursuing right now. It is the line they're pursuing. I don't yeah. think it's a credible line and that it can be continued, but I, I simply make that point. Yes. If they can continue to adopt that line uh, and, and we get to the point, you're saying that... Um, if they then refuse, refuse to support Scotland uh, in its uh, uh, application to become a member of the European Union. Uh, That's hypothetical. I it, it is hypothetical. I, I would say I, I find it very unlikely. It is possible. I think it would be entirely wrong. Um, and as I say, it comes from this um, position, as I see it, that the, the UK government is, as I say, looking through this issue uh, from the wrong end of the telescope. They are looking at a situation, and you see this in their papers, uh, uh, and uh, you see that the, the, uh, when they commissioned their advice from Professors Crawford and Boyle, the questions they asked were the status of Scotland and the RUK in international law after Scottish independence, uh, in particular the strength of the position that the RUK would be treated as a continuation of the United Kingdom as a matter of international law, and uh, an independent Scotland would be a successful state. And the second one was after Scottish independence, the principles that would apply to determining the position of the RUK and an independent Scotland with international organisations. Um, now, um, you, you'll see just from reading those questions that have been asked that they're all framed in terms of after independence. 
They've not been asked, what is the position between a yes vote and independence? They've not been asked, what are the principles that ought to apply in, during that period? Uh, and what are the obligations of the UK towards Scotland during that period? Now, if the position of the UK towards Scotland is that um, we will do nothing for you at all, then that is something I think people are entitled to, to know now. I would find that an extreme position for them to take. But I think, if, I mean, let's be realistic about this. I mean, end of the day, you're talking about nations looking at the best interest of their, their, their population. So that they don't need to do anything if they don't want to. You can't force them to do anything. You can rely on people's goodwill, but you, 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 we're not in a position to force people to do anything. And I think that to, to, to have an assumption that people need to play the nice guy, let's get, with, let's get with the real world. I mean, not only the UK will have an opportunity to then to say whether they want us to be a member or not, but other European unions will also want to make that decision whether they want us to be part of the European Union or not. And also they may wish to add caveats to under what circumstances they would want us to be members of the European Union. So, yeah, it's not as straightforward as I think you're suggesting that it could be. It could be, but it's not going to be. I mean, in the real world, it doesn't happen that way. Well, I, I, I don't have the, the gift of foresight to tell you exactly what is going to happen. Yeah. In my view, I'm setting up a position what ought to happen, having regard uh, to... Uh, That's a little naive to expect people well, to no, I, I, I don't, roll I don't over and play, play good. I, I just feel I'm not, I'm not being na naive. I mean, you're, uh, with, with respect, I think you're being very cynical. And, I'm not. I'm just uh, being realistic. I mean. No, there are clearly a range of outcomes uh, that could come about, but um, I, do not, um, I do not believe that the UK will then try and uh, drive uh, Scotland into the ground. Uh, what we have here is uh, the, the UK government is very... Uh, fond of uh, describing the union uh, as a family, as a, a marriage, uh, and it's a marriage. It was, uh, it's a marriage that was formed uh, in the, the 18th century and doesn't seem to have moved on. If what the UK is now saying to us, uh, we want you to stay, but if you're going, uh, we're keeping the house, we're keeping the pension, we're keeping all our friends. I don't think that's what they're saying. I don't think they will say that. I don't think that would be uh, remotely equitable under international law. See, I'm, I'm testing your evidence. What you're, what you're suggesting is this is what ought to happen. And I'm, what I'm saying is, well, it's very good wishing that that ought to happen. But in the real world, it doesn't happen that way. When you have a divorce, you don't say, oh, it was nice being with you for 20 years, but cheerio. It doesn't happen that way. People, you know, it, it gets quite nasty. And I'm... Well, it, um, sorry, finish. Yeah. So therefore, I am saying that what you're suggesting, that they, in principle, should do this, and in principle, they should do that, there is no principle for doing this and doing that. It's a simple matter of negotiation, and the negotiation that takes place needs to take place. People will take their best interest of what they're negotiating for, and therefore one should not assume that we're going to have the goodwill of anybody in Europe, including the United Kingdom. But there are, there are principles. There are two principles. The, 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 the first there's the principle that uh, assets should be divided equitably. Now, there's obviously room for argument on how that should go. Uh, but the second point is that you have had evidence from Mr Avery and others that it's in the best interest of the UK uh, to maintain a smooth entry for Scotland, and, and for the rest of Europe, to maintain a smooth entry uh, for uh, Scotland into Europe uh, on the terms it already enjoys. I don't disagree with that. I agree with that. It is in the best interest, but what I'm, what I'm suggesting is what is being hoped in principle, may not actually pan out to be in reality. And that's the, that's the point that I'm making. So I, I'm disagreeing with what you're suggesting. I, I agree that there's a wide range of possible outcomes. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I have no issue with that. I'm dealing in the realms of probability, likelihood, and principle. Uh, and that is where I'm coming from, and I think where a number of other witnesses have come from on that. But I accept your point. The UK could take a very extreme position in relation to Scotland. Uh, as I say, if, if that is the view, it would be useful for Scottish voters to know that now. I think it's extremely unlikely that it would. OK, Jimmy McGregor. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mr Malone, um, you, you've referred a great deal to Mr Avery and David Edwards' testimonies. And we have that, all that on record, along with a lot of other witnesses as well. Um, what, what I'd like to ask you is, as long ago as 2004, 
the then President of the European Commission, Romano Prodi, stated almost exactly the same argument as his successor, Jose Manuel Barroso, that upon independence, Scotland would be cease to be part of the EU. Now, that's coming from um, people with some experience. I you know, hope you would agree with that. Um, in your opinion, why do you think the Scottish Government hasn't examined arguments which go back a decade? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they have examined the argument. The argument is the same. I, I can't speak for the Scottish Government, and I don't purport to. But um, the argument is the same one that is being advanced now. And as Mr Avery said, it's not the complete picture. Uh, and uh, uh, as Sir David was saying, who is a, a judge uh, or was a judge uh, in Europe, he, he thinks that's well, incorrect. Well, I mean, my, okay, my right, opinion well, okay, is, as say, I say, it coincides. Say, okay, forget the Scottish Government. I mean... Have you examined this? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, and why do, you, why, why do you come to the conclusion? Because, I mean, if Spain, for example, you, you know, we, we've accepted we're in uncharted waters at the moment, uncharted waters. Um, how do we know that Spain would simply not just say no to Scottish membership? Well, no... Um current EU member has, uh, or no EU member has said that they would say no to date. Um, we, we don't know. They might do that. I think it's extremely unlikely, and we can only go on the, on the basis of probabilities. Isn't the probability from most, uh, you know, from, uh, likely that Article 49 seems to be the, the route that would have to be taken on this? No, uh, for the reasons I gave earlier. Uh, that would involve Scotland applying from out with Europe, uh, which is, in, as I say, in, in no one's interest. Um, it would create, it would be an absurdity, uh, as Mr. Avery and Mr. Avery, to keep going back to And I say that because, as I say, they are very experienced in these matters, much more experienced than me, um, and uh, they are impartial, and I don't claim to be. So um, I am trying to uh, be objective in all of this. Uh, I look at... Um, uh, and you, you know, I think you're entitled to ask yourself in relation to some of, other, some of these other comments that are being made by various people... Um, are they entirely impartial in all of this or do they have other interests that they're looking to? Uh, and what I would say about that um, is that you can listen to what individuals are saying or you can look at how Europe actually operates. Uh, and again, we have a lot of evidence from Mr Avery and from Sir David on how Europe actually operates. Uh, and, the, uh, and to summarise that, it is that Europe finds a way forward and there will be a solution found. Well, turning to another subject then, um, if internal UK negotiations fail to reach a currency agreement, um, will Scotland be forced to apply to join the euro? And if it does not meet the euro criteria to join it, where would it go then? Well, I think we're now uh, straying into economics and interesting areas like that. Um, I mean, Scotland, and again, there's been uh, a lot of uh, evidence uh, about this. Um, Scotland cannot... Um, be forced to join the euro. It wouldn't have its own currency to join into the ERM. It wouldn't meet the criteria. Um, so, you know, as of day one of independence, that's not going to happen. Um, and, and, and on the question of the currency generally, uh, my, my view is that, again, it's, it's clearly overwhelmingly in the interest of the continuing, the, the former UK and Scotland, to be in that sort of uh, currency Union. Now, um, you, you can ask what will happen if it's not agreed. Um, my view is that it is going to be agreed. It's extremely likely to be agreed. It's what uh, businesses want. And I think the over, uh, both north and south of the border, and I think the overarching uh, consideration here is uh, stability and continuity, and that ultimately those are the, the considerations uh, that will, the, will rule the day. Um, I don't think, and uh, my concern is in all of this, is that Scotland should somehow be uh, punished uh, if its people decide to exercise the right of self-determination and that they should be out of the club, out of the currency, all of these things. I think that's quite wrong. And I don't actually think it's what people think. I think that what is happening is that people are creating a great deal of uncertainty because that uh, benefits the no campaign, ultimately. Well, well, I mean, actually, the uncertainty has been created by the fact to some extent, that 
uh, th there's a difference of opinion within the SNP about what currency they would like to use. Would you agree with that? There's a difference of opinion within the Yes campaign that I'm aware of. Um, I don't know about the SNP um, internally. I couldn't speak for them. Let me tell you that Dennis Canavan, for example, well, who I think was head of the Yes. He's the Yes campaign. Sorry, I'm, I'm distinguishing between the SNP and the, and the Yes campaign. Okay. Uh, I know that Mr Canavan, I think also the Green All Party... All right, okay, he's not a member of the SNP, but um, the Yes... Uh, there yes. is a difference of opinion in the Yes campaign over yes. what currency they would use, which is why I'm asking you the question... If, if, if they didn't use the pound, which currency would they use? Well, I don't think that's a question I can answer. Um, that, that would ultimately be a matter for the, the Government of Scotland of the day, uh, and, and who will be voted on the basis of policies that they're putting forward. Um, but as I say, I find it uh, extremely unlikely that they would reach that position, because um, similarly with, with the Scotland European membership we have with um, the, the UK currency, uh, we don't have the UK... Uh, ruling it out. No one has ruled it out. Uh, they say, oh, it'll be a difficult negotiation and all the rest of it. No one is ruling it out. They won't say uh, yes or no, we're in favour of it or we're against it in principle. They're just, they're just maximising the uncertainty around the question. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Patricia Ferguson. Sorry um, to begin with this, Mr Malone, but I, I have to admit I'm slightly confused. Can I just ask, are you, are you representing Business for Scotland here this morning? Uh, no. No, I, I provided them with that uh, opinion, but I'm not representing Business for Scotland. I'm here in a personal capacity. Right, so you're here in a personal capacity and you're a specialist in construction and dispute arbitration. Yes, those are principal areas of interest. Thank you. Um, you've... Um, mentioned that, in your view, and in those of the two experts you've quoted, that Article 48 would be the method of, of joining the EU or of maintaining membership of the EU that you would prefer and that you think is most valid. Yes. But given that Scotland is not, in and of itself, a signatory to any of the treaties of the EU, and given that Article 49 is in fact designed to accommodate new states wishing to become members, why is Article 49 dismissed so thoroughly as you seem to think it is? Um, I, I think, well, as I, as I said, I think Article 49 envisages a, a state which is an applicant in the process uh, starting from ground zero, if you like, and working up uh, through uh, candidate membership to become a full member uh, of Europe. Uh, I, I'm not dis dismissing this entirely. What I'm saying is that, uh, yes, it's a route. Scotland would have to be outside Europe to adopt it because you have to be a state before you can apply under Article 49. Uh, and that's all fine. But uh, that means that you have an interim period where you have uh, this, uh, well, this, this, this period of absurdity where you have... Uh, European citizens losing their rights uh, in relation to Scotland, its territory, its institution, where you have uh, Scottish citizens losing their rights, potentially, although potentially not, because they will still have UK passports and therefore may still uh, enjoy um, UK citizenship. So you have um, what has been described variously as an absurdity, as a illegal nightmare uh, by various people. And uh, so that is not desirable, um, what is desirable, in my view, uh, is the route under Article 48, which could allow for continuity of effect uh, and stability and common sense, I would suggest. Now, Scotland cannot make an application under Article 48. That would have to come from the UK government. But my uh, position is that the UK government uh, could and ought to make that application. But this is where I think your argument falls down, and that is that Scotland cannot make an application under Article 48 either. No, so said the UK government would have to do that. Yes. So in either situation, Scotland is going to be dependent on the UK government to make those applications. Now, I actually think that those who argue for Article 48 are making a big error in many ways, because I think under Article 49 it's entirely possible to make accommodations, because Europe is particularly good at accommodations, that would actually allow Scotland to become a member in its own right, in a very similar way to Article 48. And why it is that people get hung up on Article 48, I find very, very difficult to understand. However, I think we do, as you said, 
have to consider how Europe actually operates. And at the end of the day, it's a political entity. And there are political movers within the EU who would not necessarily be very keen to see Scotland have a swift passage into the EU as a member state. And I would just cite to you a vote that took place in the Committee of the Regions, not, I would be the first to admit, a representative vote, but a vote where overwhelmingly the, rel the representatives of um, organisations, uh, legislative organisations throughout the EU voted overwhelmingly that the method of accession for a region or a state ceding from another member state would be Article 49. So if we're looking at the practicalities and we're looking at how Europe operates in reality, is Article 49 not actually the best way to do it? No. Um, for the reasons I said earlier, I, I hear what you're saying about the Committee of the Regions, uh, and with respect, I would say that that um, is uh, not strictly relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, well, it actually is. It's very relevant, actually. Well, the, the, that committee wouldn't be determinative of the issue. It would be the Council, ultimately the members, um, who, who would... And, and as I say, none of them have said that they're going to, to veto. Um, uh, and, and again, go, if we go back to the oral evidence of Sir David, um, he says that um, what I, my personal opinion is that following a vote on independence, it would be the obligation of the United Kingdom to table a proposal for the amendment of the treaties to take account of the situation that will occur at the time when Scotland becomes independent of the rest of the UK. Uh, and I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And that is because um, if you look at um, the referendum, um, <clears throat> Uh, and the key point um, that I think many people are missing, and I, and I exclude uh, Sir David and Graham Avery and uh, Professor Keating and men, men, many others from that, but a lot of people are missing, is that in UK constitutional theory, in the event of a yes vote, nothing happens. Um, nothing happens until the date of independence. Nothing happens for external purposes. Uh, the UK is still a unitary state, and it is still the legal person for international purpose. It still has responsibility for Scotland vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Um, but just as important, nothing happens internally in terms of strict UK uh, constitutional theory. Uh, the Edinburgh Agreement does not empower the, the Scottish Parliament to then trot off and make a unilateral declaration of independence. So the constitutional reality in UK terms is that the day after the yes vote, nothing has changed, uh, and Parliament is still sovereign, uh, albeit one would expect uh, that we will respect the outcome of the referendum and make it work, as indeed it is signed up to do. Um, so that leaves two possible scenarios between this referendum and the date of independence. Either uh, the UK can engage positively, as I say it has already undertaken to do, uh, and to ask for amendments to the treaty to recognise the fact that by its own uh, constitutional process, it is dividing itself into two states, uh, an application under Article 48, or it does nothing, as it has been suggested it might do, uh, and, and since Scotland uh, would not have the competence to engage directly with Europe on a formal basis uh, or to make any formal application uh, and has no legal personality, would have no legal personality for international purposes, uh, then at that point, uh, when it becomes independent, it would make an application under Article 49. But that is hugely undesirable for reasons that have been set out in some detail by others. We have had the evidence of others and we are considering that evidence. So it would be very helpful to actually have your responses to the questions that are being posed. However, let me just ask one more question and that is, the chapters of the White Paper on Independence that talk about EU relations, do you disagree with any of the points made in that particular uh, section of the White Paper? You have to guide me to it, I don't have it before me. Well. Perhaps you might like to read it and give us your written thoughts on that particular... Well, I have, I have read it. I'm, uh, I'm, I don't disagree with the, the points that are made within it, um, but if you have a specific point you have in mind, then I could answer that for you. No, if you had a specific point of disagreement, that would be the one I'd want to hear about, but if you haven't, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Claire Adamson. Um, uh, thank you, convener. Um, Mr Malone, you mentioned that you were involved in the Law Society's Constitutional Committee. Um, has that committee examined this issue? Uh, it, it has. I'm, I'm not here to speak for the Law Society or its committee. It is looking at it, and I understand there will be a submission made. 
Thank you very much. Um, if I could go back to um, the points made by Hans Malik and your discussion about how the the nature and um, Mr Malik made some assertions about how those negotiations might go and the assets of the UK were mentioned, but are the liabilities not the other side of that coin? Uh, yes, I mean, <clears throat> if you're looking at strict international law, um, then there are a variety of possible outcomes there in terms of division of assets and liabilities. Again, I think it is, it is to approach the problem from the wrong end to talk about, well, we, we divide, there's independence, and then we have an argument about these things. Uh, and again, it comes back to uh, dispute resolution um, and whether you want to try and reach a consensual position, uh, which is clearly in everyone's interest, or whether you want to let things go and end up in some sort of adjudicative dispute process where a third party is imposing uh, a decision because at that stage everything becomes a hostage to fortune for both sides. Uh, and I don't see that's in anybody's interest. So um, the, the general principle of, of an equitable division, uh, it seems to me, ought to, to rule the day. Certainly. Um, so um, in terms of what Mr Malik was saying, it would, it would be all... Um, against Scotland's interest in that. It would be in the interest of both the rest of the UK and Scotland to reach a consensual agreement in the negotiation process. Yes. Thank you. Um, in terms of some of the evidence we took early in the committee's deliberations, um, Eamon O'Neill was here and I think he, he described the idea of a whole in, in terms of human rights of existing EU citizens in, in Scotland as being a sort of nightmare scenario. Um, Given that um, if, if Scotland came out of the EU at any point, could you, could you maybe say a bit more about the impact that would have on other EU nationals and businesses and the existing treaties and with, with EU, within the EU regarding the fisheries and, and what impact that would have if there was a hole there? Well, I think it would be very problematic. Um, I think um, if there is nothing in place um, and we uh, get to the midnight hour of the Day of Independence and we have um, EU citizens in Scotland who suddenly lose all their entitlements um, under the EU regime, um, obviously that's, that would be incredibly problematic. Um, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, the, the Scottish territorial waters um, uh, if we are suddenly out of Europe and, and no longer part of the common fisheries, uh, does that mean, well, it would mean, I suppose, that all these uh, EU fishermen have to then leave Scottish waters? Now, that might suit some people, I suppose, but um, uh, I think from an EU citizen's point of view, uh, that would be disastrous. So, um, as I say, the, the, for these many several reasons, I think um, this continuity of effect uh, is what suits or would suit everyone all around Scotland and the other EU members, including the former UK. If I, I could quote Professor Cram from that evidence session um, with the direct question of whether it would be 48, 49, she said that I think the lawyers will come up with a compromise. It may have an Article 49 process that in practice looks more like Article 48. Um, in your experience and given the evidence from other um, people such as um, Mr Avery last week, um, do you believe a pragmatic, pragmatic approach and a solution will be found to prevent this hole in the EU? Yes, I do. Uh, I mean, that is consistent with, in my view, it's consistent with how the EU operates and what the EU does. Um, there have been a number of examples talked about where uh, strict rules, uh, or in the face of it, strict rules have been uh, become flexible to accommodate a reality because ultimately it is a political organisation uh, and there will be a political reality uh, that needs to be addressed and fixed and the, the problem you're talking about with the, the, the black hole of rights is, is clearly a difficult problem that we need to be fixed. Uh, I don't uh, uh, agree that Article 49 is appropriate because it would necessarily involve, uh, an, it's a more formal process, it would involve an accession period, therefore there, there would be that hiatus. Uh, and uh, as Mr Avery said, and, and I agree with them, the process of negotiating the interim position and then negotiating a new accession uh, would be far more complicated uh, than simply uh, effectively 
dividing up the current position. As I said, the, the, in my view, um, what we're talking about here in many ways can be seen as an internal reorganisation within the EU. Okay, that our evidence from uh, you this morning, Mr Malone. If I could say thank you very much for coming along to committee. We're continuing with our inquiries and every piece of evidence that comes along is also always very helpful and informative. So thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our agenda item two, which is the Brussels Bulletin. Um, and colleagues will see we're extremely short a time now. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any comments or questions. You'll realise that the Brussels Bulletin is getting a bit lighter. Um, but it's because that there's less happening in Europe because they're obviously winding down now for the elections coming up. Um, but Katie's asked them to do a wee focus on specific things. So I think the focus this week is on oh yeah, the elections and the election process. So um, I don't know if there's any questions or comments for us bulletin. Happy to pass it to other committees for their consideration. Yes. Excellent. And we now move into private session. Thank you.